this was the church that pretty much welcomed my parents into America when they got here to the USA because they were they came as immigrants and um, they were adopted by a family when my parents got here and they started taking them to church because they were young adults. My dad was 21 years old, my mom was 18 years old, and they had a one-year-old baby when they arrived into the USA. So, and they didn't have any family. So they were blessed to meet one of their neighbors who was an Adventist, amazing lady that took them in and was like, hey, let's go to church. Because at that church, you can get some diapers for the baby. You can get some uh, free food on Sabbaths and Wednesdays and Friday nights. So they started going because of all the love that the building was bringing to them. So that became the constant uh, element in my life growing up in East LA, Los Angeles, going to public school. And all those years, um, eventually I was a teenager and one thing that I used to love doing was something that I saw some of the kids doing here. It's going up to the piano, playing with the gadgets, going up to the sound booth and peeking and see what they're doing. Of course, this is, uh, you know, early 2000s, so we didn't have the systems that we have now, but there were still computers around and all these things. So I would go up there and just kind of like peek. It got to the point where I wanted to be like, hey, let, let me help you, you know, do, do the thing and turn on the computer. So they're like, sure, we'll, we'll let you do, do the thing. As I got older as a teenager, that became my calling. That was the reason why I started going to church. I didn't go to church for the sermons or Sabbath school or because sister and brother. I would go to church because I had to turn on the computer and make sure the soundboard was properly set up for the director. And I was a 14-year-old kid. And I would sometimes, I would catch a ride with a friend, I would catch a ride with my aunt, not that my parents were not going to church, they were going to church, but now I had brothers. So they were trying to take care of the, the, the kids and making sure they're running out the door. So that was the blessing in my life that I was taken in by the media team to help out. And with time, as you know, I started getting older, was a teenager, 15, 16, you start getting into the age, the age of, okay, what's next? You know, you're in high school, and they start, the counselor starts asking, hey, what, what's next for you? What do you want to do? What do you enjoy doing? And I was always like, well, I like math. I like science. Yes, that's kind of weird that someone likes math and science. So I was like, I'm going to be an engineer. Little did I know that God had a different plan for my life. Little did I know that he had been prepping me all those years for my real calling, and that was a huge blessing. I went off to college, and I thought I was gonna be a computer engineer, but turns out that I enjoyed cameras more than I enjoyed computers. And that was, it, it was a blessing to know it, but also to see that God had prepared me all those years to, to find my real calling. So as I'm in college, I'm attending a film program. I'm attending UCLA, uh, their film production program for cinematography. And I started noticing a trend that I saw in my church. And I was like, why is there never any good videos on my church? Why is it that every time they're putting up the, uh, I was attending a Hispanic church. I was like, why is it that every time they put videos, there's no good videos? So I said, well, maybe I'm going to go into media and video production so I can make videos for the church. Again, not knowing what God was putting in the way and bringing into my life to, and, and these were just, and I say those were my ideas, but that was the Holy Spirit planting ideas in my head for what was to come. Because back then, we're talking again, you know, back in 2005, media production, cameras in the church, that was not really a thing. Uh, you know, screens, you know, we were doing projections for PowerPoints and presentations, but we were not thinking of streaming and videos and video evangelism and all these things. We were not thinking about that. But I always knew, I was like, well, I know the future is in video production. Maybe the future of the church also has to do with video. So I kept going, kept going. And then it got to the point where I graduated college and I was like, I am ready to serve the church. 
I am ready to make videos. I made a calling to my conference, and they said, cool story, we'll call you back. And they never called me back. <laughs> so I was like, well, I guess we'll, we'll keep doing things somewhere else. So I went off to do things. Uh, I got to work in short films, music production, got to meet a lot of famous celebrities in LA, doing all those things, but I always knew that I wanted to give back to the church. I always knew, but I never found the platform. I was never giving. Funny thing is, I still kept going back to my local church, and I kept helping, pushing the buttons, turning on the computer, but I always knew, I was like, I know I can do more than just that. I know there's something else. You know, I don't think God has brought me through this whole journey and taken me to one of the top film schools in the world for me to just come to church and turn on the computer. That, that, that's not it. I don't think that's, that's God's plan for my life. So I kept, I kept thinking and I kept praying about it. Somehow, randomly, I ended up in Oklahoma. And in Oklahoma, life happened, but I, also ke I always kept making videos, kept making videos. And one day, as I got married to my wife, Delia, back there, she's been a huge support in my ministry. And then one day I get a Facebook message saying, hey, are you looking for a job? Uh, sure, you know, it's kind of weird that someone offers you a job via Facebook Messenger, right? You know what's even weirder? That a conference president sent me a Facebook message saying, do you want a job? And that was the Washington Conference, conference president, Doug Bing, who sent me a Facebook message saying, hey, are you interested in a job position? We're looking for someone that knows media, someone that knows video production. He's like, I've been following some of your work, and I think you fit the needs we have. This was summer of 2019. We didn't know what was to come. So me and my wife are honeymooning, traveling, and I'm like, sure. Before that, we had always said, we got married summer 2019, and we said, January 1st, 2020, we're both gonna get new jobs. Like we're gonna start applying for new jobs and uh, something, something's gonna happen. By November 2019, we both had guaranteed jobs at the Washington Conference, which we had not planned for. We, God knows, God knows his ways. He knows why he does things. So we land here, funny thing, we were looking at our, you know how Facebook does the Facebook memories thing? Today we were looking at our Facebook's memory. Three years ago we were driving up here because we were moving to Washington Conference. Exactly three years ago, and I saw our Facebook memories and it was me and my wife and our dogs in the car. And you know, we we're posting pictures of our journey. So we land here, we start working, and we didn't know what was to come. Six weeks later, after we start working at the Washington Conference, something called COVID. Just, just takes everything down, you know, shuts everything down, businesses go down, um, churches have to close the doors, and luckily, God had brought us, and it's not luck, God had brought us for such a time to be able to help Washington Conference keep spreading the word of God via live stream, via cameras, via the internet, because God knew why he had prepared us on this journey. And it's a huge blessing, and it's one of those, we never know God's ways. We don't know why he does certain things. I never knew why he put me in the sound booth at 12 years old to like turn on the computer. I never knew why the constant was always that same church. I never knew why I could go to this university yet and not work for my church yet. But it was God preparing the way. And that's kind of, a little bit of my story, but I want to focus on that same element today. And I know the title said media training, but I think it's more of a, I call it light, turning on the light bulbs training, because that is something that needs to happen at our church when it comes to media and media production. It is something that we know we need the cameras, we know we need those things, but in this day and age, we have a whole generation that is growing up with these things in our hands that have cameras. These things are way more powerful than anything we've ever experienced. I'm sure you've read that an iPhone right now has way more technology than 
the space shuttle from 1969. Any of those space shuttles, this thing is more powerful than, than, than any of those things. So, but it's also a tool, like everything else, that can be used for good or for bad. Just like a hammer can be used to build a house, you can also use a hammer to hurt someone, to break into something, but you could also use it to build a hospital. So that is something that we've been really talking about because it's really interesting that we know in the Bible and through prophecy that at the end of times, technology is gonna ramp up. We know technology is duplicating and multiplying itself at crazy rates at this moment. And to me, I say, good, because we cannot stop it from happening. But we need to learn how to use it to also spread the gospel of God. Because if we are afraid of it and we step away from it, somebody else will use it for bad. Because if we're not using it for good, it can only be used for bad. So that, uh, I was at a, we were at a ministries convention this past weekend where we got to collaborate and talk with a lot of other directors around the division from other states and other conferences. And a question was brought up in one of the presentations, and I'll open up the question to you. Do you think Jesus would be on social media? Jesus would be on social media. I hear a lot of yeses. I hear a lot of yeses. So that was the question that was brought up. Somebody said maybe. So can somebody tell me why would Jesus be on social media? Reach the gospel, yes. Um, 80 percent of the population in the U.S. is on social media. They are on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, now we have TikTok, which is the, grow the fastest growing platform we have. We have other more private ones like Be Real, and we have other ones that kind of have died out like Snapchat. So social media is a whole other, a whole other world, but it is social media. It is a platform where we have to combine our media talents and our media resources with platforms that are meant to be social. Just like our church is meant to be social, you know, we're here to the community. Sadly, a lot of people have taken social media and made it into either uh, we're going to argue media, we're going to talk about politics media, we're going to post a bunch of dark stuff media, or they've made it into an announcement board media. Sadly, some of our churches have turned, it, have turned social media into announcement board media. And we're not sharing much of our social stories. And this is gonna be the challenge that I'm gonna bring out to you and that you're gonna, uh, I want you to take home today. The challenge is for us to use our media talents, our media resources, and our churches to shine some light and bring some light into the darkness of social media. Because in that conversation that we were having, would Jesus be on social media? We were talking, a lot of people, I was, having, I was sharing with Pastor Hans, a lot of people have moved away from social media because it has become such a dark place. It's become a place where, like I said, you know, everybody argues, it's so political, all these things. But would that be, should that be a reason why we should move away from spreading the gospel and bringing the light? We are called to be the light of the world. And if these places have become so dark, why are we not shining light through the voice of Jesus, through what the Holy Spirit has brought into us? And that is the mission that the Washington Conference, my department in communications has, is really going really hard 2023. Our mission is to tell Seattle and Washington State who Washington Conference is because that is part of what our community needs to know. You know, as we're driving past this building, does our community know what this building really is? You know, as we're driving past Maranatha Church, as we're driving past Breath of Life, we might know that Adventists gather there, but does the person down the street know what happens in that building? Do they know what these individuals are doing in this building? That is the mission and the challenge today. 
we need to use social media to spread the awareness that we're doing because I know we are doing amazing things in our churches. We are doing amazing community service. We're feeding the homeless. We're feeding the needy. We're meeting the needs of our communities, but sometimes we're not sharing that with those out there. And I think that is a, when it comes to, this is another little topic, a little different. When it comes to branding, the brand of your church is, a lot of people think brand is what I think my church is. No, the brand of your church is what the community knows about your church, what the community sees. How does your community describe your church? And that is what we need to do with our media resources because we already have the media. Social media is free. We don't have to pay anything to make a post. So that's where these elements start coming in. We have the element of media. Now we have the element of the social media. Now we need to start identifying what is the heart and personality of my church? What is the personality of Mount Tahoma Church? What is the personality of Maranatha Church? Now that we know the personality and identity and the values, now we need to showcase that to the world. That way we can reach other people and they can come and partake in the blessings that are happening here. So that sounds like a lot. And I feel some of you are like, man, Ernesto, you're giving us a lot to do. But we have so many talented people sitting in our churches that are wishing to do something. Just like I was sitting there, just turning on the computer and turning it off, I wanted to do something else. I wanted to do something even bigger. But I, I never knew what it was. And my directors didn't know what it was. God knew what it was, but he said, later. But if we know how to harness and start looking at those talents around our churches, that is something when you truly get to know your church members, when we truly get to know one another, we truly get to know our talents and skills. I was talking to my brother Victor and I was like, I love going to churches and talking to people. And one of the things I always ask is, what do you do? Because the moment I know what they do is the moment I can say, your talent, what you do, we're gonna use it. How can I use your talent to help spread the gospel? How can we use it? Because your talent is one of those things that you don't have to tell me twice to do something because I love it so much. So that is something that we need to start doing within our congregations, especially with our, with our young adults. Sometimes that happens. I've talked to young adults that have said, I've left my church because I was not really doing anything. Not that they were not being filled with the spirit, not that they didn't enjoy the sermons, they just wanted to do something. And that is something that's really big in the millennial and Gen Z generation. They are looking for purpose within the church. And purpose does not mean, hey, I need you to go open the doors and take out the trash. Purpose is, okay, can you help me build something? Can you help me, uh, how can we build a strategy to better spread the gospel? bringing them to the table and saying, okay, so you happen to, I was talking to a church member the other day at it, and she said she happens to run a marketing agency and very well-known agency in Seattle. And she goes to church and she sits at church. And I was like, hey, why haven't you ever helped your church with your agency and all your time? She's like, never been asked for it. Nobody really cares for it just kind of been kicked to the side. She's like, but I would love to help them. I would love to have a purpose to help keep spreading the gospel. But sadly, it's been, it's been a skill and talent and profession that's been kicked off to the side. And that is something, like I said, that it's happening a lot in, uh, in studying, doing also like generational studies with millennials and Gen Zs. And now we have Gen Alpha are the, the kiddos that are running around. Their generation, their world is going to be so different. So, so different. I, sometimes I look at kids that are six years old, and I, and I think I cannot imagine the world they're going to grow up in 
because that, that world is going to be so foreign to me. I might think I'm cool and I'm hip and I'm like, I know all the cool trendy things. But when the six years old or 18 or 20, that world is going to be so foreign to me. And again, knowing and talking to them, talking to them, knowing what's happening. How are, how can we build strategies around that? So knowing how to use media, something that Washington Conference had and a lot of churches had a blessing that they were already looking into, you know, tapping into media resources. Some of them were already dabbling a little bit on live stream. Something that I think is really um, funny, really, it, it was really funny at the beginning of COVID. Um, one of our, an elder at a church that I used to attend when I lived in Oklahoma, he was really anti-video games. He had his reasons why, you know, he, he just always talked about kids and video games and video games and video games. And then I, I started laughing one day because I was like, the reason why we're able to live stream at our churches and have equipment that is affordable and easy to reach for the everyday person is because of video games. The video game world made um, teenagers nowadays, they live stream their video games. You know, they're not just playing video games, but they also send it to the internet so other people can watch it. And yeah, that's a thing. It sounds really weird, but that's a thing that uh, teenagers are watching other teenagers playing video games on the internet. And sometimes they're watching, my, I know because my brother does it, he watches uh, these teenagers from um, like New York, or sometimes from like Colombia that are streaming. I'm like, you find that entertaining watching? Like, isn't it more entertaining for you to play the video game? He's like, no, no, it's cool because you get to see how they play and how good they are. Okay, but that world made live streaming become so affordable that any church, no matter your budget, could have live streaming equipment. And, and so that, I found that funny because that brother that was always, you know, bashing video games and all these things, he was one of the first ones to call me during COVID and he said, Ernesto, how can we live stream the church service? And I was like, hey, you know that one store where they sell video games? They have all the equipment you need. And um, it, it was really, really funny to, I was like, I was like, I wonder how awkward he felt walking into the store and asking for the equipment. But that, that, that was the reality of things. And again, we're, we're starting to see how, how these tools that we would call secular world tools have become a blessing to our churches. We are able to you know, stream this to a thousand and millions. You know, there's no restrictions on how many people can watch the services. There's no restrictions on where you can send the data, where you can send the video. But it's, it's something that we need to learn to harness those tools. And I am blessed because that is part of my job. Finding creative solutions to use media to spread the gospel to others. And again, that is, that is the challenge always. And I say, sometimes we have to like really change our little ways of thinking because we need to start getting really creative on how we're spreading the gospel nowadays. You know, it's not just standing in the pulpit anymore. Now it's actually going into these social networks and maybe not just going into them and posting a sermon, but also posting how we are being the feet and hands of Jesus in the community. Because we're living in a generation where also our, uh, that's a huge other change that is happening and we see it a lot here in Seattle. Millennial generation and the Gen Z generation, they're no longer about like, oh, there's a church, let me walk into it. We're living in a world where we're fighting for people's attention. And they just, I was, I was telling someone, you can take a photography course for free on YouTube. So why would anyone pay to go to a four-year university for a photography degree? There's no reason. But why do people go to universities? Because of the hands-on, the connections, the community, the friendships they build, the network that happens there, you don't get any of that on YouTube. So we as churches, that is the challenge we need to have when we're live streaming 
our programs. You know, a, a lot of churches say, well, people are watching the live stream, but how, I've had churches say, we're gonna cut our live stream because people don't wanna come into the building. Well, we need to, what is the value that we're giving people by coming into the building? Because if the, all the value we're showing is the sermon, then I'd rather stay home and watch the live stream. But how can we, as a church, bring value so people can come into our buildings? So those younger generations that are not really interested in religion, but are really interested in being community service directors, that are really interested in serving the community, that are really interested, I, I always say it's interesting because they're not interested in religion, but they are interested in being the hands and feet of Jesus. But they say, oh no, we don't wanna to go to church. I'm like, well, we need to redefine what church is. You know, and that is something I talk to many of my friends that have been hurt by non-denominational churches and other religions. And I'm like, I love the Adventist church because we have a great message. The fact that we believe in the health message, the fact that we care for our members to be healthy, like that's huge. I don't know any other, other church in the world that wants their members to be healthy. Yet we have a whole generation out there that is really fighting for the health of their communities, well, let's, let's work together. Because, it, it, so then they start seeing like, oh wait, there's a church that actually cares for my health? There's a church that cares for my, that cares for my relationships? And then they start walking into the building. That's how, that's how we can use our media and social media to evangelize and bring people in. I always say, don't tell me who you are, show me who you are. We need to show these generations through our social media who we truly are, who our churches are. And that's how we start working on the branding of our churches and of our buildings and attracting these generations, especially here in the big cities. It's so interesting because it's, it's uh, I have so many conversations with young adults that are not religious or non-Adventist and they, they always say like, hey, you're always talking about this or this. I'm like, yeah, because that's what we talk at church. And same thing, they're like, wait, your church talks about that? Your church is talking about social justice? Your church is talking about diabetes and anxiety? And your church has like a retreat for depression? It's like, yeah, we have those. So it, it, they are so interested. And I see some of you kind of being like, Wait, what? We have a depression retreat? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we, had a, we had an anxiety and depression retreat not too long ago, and we had amazing testimonies come out of that, and that was through health ministries. But again, it's, it's knowing how to spread that, that message and showing others about it. So I think that's, that's the challenge today for not just, post, not just telling, but let's show our communities who we are through our media. And starting to get to know the talents. I was telling somebody, we have a lot of teens, a lot of young a lot of teenagers with phones. Hey, we're having days of celebration. Can you guys make a little quick little TikTok video, a little reel, a little short format video with your phones? I mean, they're already on their phones. They're already making videos for their personal use. Well, can you help us make one? four days of celebration? Can you help us make one for our health retreat? Can you help us make one? And that is something that we're trying to do with the Washington Conference, the, with my department, and with our academies. We already have students in the video department learning about cameras and media and streaming, but now we wanna train them on like properly curating content for social media. So these teenagers are not just there playing with their phones anymore, now they're using their phones as a tool to help us spread the gospel of God. And they're not the ones gonna sit there and preach to the phone, no. But if we have Pastor Lane, who's a great speaker, we can have a teenager film him, and he can do a quick edit and post it on social media, that is evangelism. That is another way of evangelism. Jesus, we have the gospels, if Jesus was on social media, he would not be the one typing or posting because he had his disciples to write the gospels. 
Jesus had, I, I always said, Jesus had one of the disciples was his PR director, another one was a marketing director, another one was a consultant, another one was the media director, another one was the one like, okay, where's, it was kind of like, okay, where are you speaking next? So that, that was, he had, they weren't just, they were his disciples learning from him, but also they were the ones that wrote down all the content. They were content creators of their age. So nowadays we have tools like cell phones where we can have our younger generation be the content creators uh, for our generation. So knowing, starting to look at those talents, because we can do two things. When I was here and we had some kids playing with the drums and the piano, that could have gone two ways. Someone could have gone up there and say like, hey, get out of there, stop playing with it. Or somebody could have been like, hey, you enjoy the drums? Let me teach you to play the drums so you can be our next drummer. So which one are we? And that's for us to decide which one are we gonna be. If we see someone that is really good editing videos, editing pictures, are we gonna take away their tool or are we gonna help them use that tool for good use. I'll give you a quick story. Um, I had this conversation at a church and there was a mom and she shared with us her testimony. She said, she said, I've been watching the news and the news said that TikTok is really bad and my kids should not be on it. So the moment she found out one of her sons was on TikTok, she grabbed the phone, took it away and said, you need to stop using that. You need to stop using it because it's bad. It's bad, it's bad, it's bad. And, and the kid was just like, well, sure, I guess. And then I gave the presentation. That incident had happened sometime that week before the presentation. Uh, the mom grabbed my phone after the presentation. She's like, oh, thanks for sharing. I'll grab your phone number if we want to invite you back to church. That week, mom went back with her, her son doesn't go to church. So she went home and she's like, so what do you do on social media? What, what do you do on TikTok? And he said, he's like, well, I like to share Bible verses on social media. He said, I've been really enjoying some Bible verses and devotionals, so I'd like to share them. And the mom's like, can you show me? Uh, she wanted to make sure he was not lying to get his phone back, so he opened it. Turns out that he had 15,000 followers wow. on TikTok that were following him because he was sharing Bible verses and little devotionals that he was editing together. And mom took away his evangelism tool. And she, at that moment, she was like, I am so sorry. And then they, had, they started talking. She was like, show me more about this. What is happening? She gave me a phone call and she's like, Ernesto, thank you so much for your presentation. She's like, not only have I been able to connect better with my son, but now I can support him on his ministry, even though he doesn't go to church, but he himself has his own little ministry, and he himself, a 14-year-old, is an evangelist to 15,000 people. And it was just mind-blowing to hear that testimony. And um, it, we started working on, on, with him, and coaching him so he can be part of the church's media team. And we told him, you don't have to be a member. Just come and keep doing what you love with your phone, with your videos, help the pastor edit his little videos, help the pastor. You don't have to get baptized, you don't have to. But that was just a way for him to come be part of the community to accept them with what he had and not just be like, oh, you have all these followers and I have to get baptized so we can, no, it was bringing him in and making him part of the team. So again, knowing how to not be afraid of, this, of social media and what these platforms have, but knowing how we can be the light in these places of darkness. Because yes, he could have been doing anything and something else, that would have been on him, but he was using it for good because he grew up in an Adventist home. He knew about devotionals. He knew about, he was probably hurt at one point at church and decided not to go to church anymore. 
But he never left Jesus. He never left the Bible. He might have left the building. And my theory is that he probably was hurt because mom said she, had, she used to attend another church and now she was attending a new church. So that kind of made me think maybe there was something that they had something at church that they were hurt. And he chose not to go back to church, but he chose to, kept, he chose to keep spreading the gospel in his own little way. So we've been working, like I said, with other teenagers at the academy to help them. They're already using these tools, which is a media tool. You know, we, we think media just means the big sound boards and the big cameras. But no, our, our cell phones are media. You know, we can, we can record audio in here. We can record video. We can, this thing, these things can do so many crazy cool things, but they can also do, they can be used for good or for bad. So I want to open it up. If anybody has any questions or comments, it's a, I feel like this is more like a workshop. If you have any questions or comments or something that you've seen or something that your church is trying to do that you need some help with, let me know what, what are some ways that you can think, and I always, like to, I always like to ask, what are some ways that your church is using creative talents for the service of God? Does anybody have any questions, comments, or something you would like to, to see? Or if you, if you say, uh, how would you suggest for a small church? Because I know there's small churches represented. There's also big churches represented. There's churches with small budgets. There's churches with very large budgets. So does anybody have any questions, comments? Yes. I have a question. Um, what are different ways that we can have um, people from the church, church members, to post um, that go back to the church's main page? So for example, you know, on, on the various platforms. So for Facebook, for TikTok, for um, Instagram, what are the ways um, by which, and I'm sure there are other people who want to know, that members can post and tag Facebook without necessarily yes. needing to share yes. all the Yes, so that is, that is the number one way that any church member can do evangelism right now, by simply hitting the share button on social media. By sharing on Facebook, you know, you click the little share and it gets posted, or by posting to your stories, if you know how that works. But as a church, it is our responsibility to give our church members good content to share. They cannot, if we're not, is the, if the church is not posting any content, then the members don't have anything to share. So it's like saying, well, we want the members to go pass out flyers, and I print one flyer, that's not gonna work. So making sure the church is on the platforms with good or decent content and consistent content, and then you as church members, the best way to do it nowadays is simply by hitting the share button. It takes five seconds to share. Now if you know how to do stories, share it to your story. But again, it's, it's one of those you need to be, we need to be giving you, the church members, good content. Because it's the same thing. I'm sure church members want to share. They just have never probably been given anything to share. Yes, I see a question back there. Um, what are we doing to help the older generation who are not willing to use Facebook or social media, what means can we still help them today? In regards to getting, you getting know, involved with these? Getting involved, uh, content, because a lot of them are still really very afraid to go on Facebook, you know? So even though we live stream on Facebook or Instagram, you know, and you to ask them, what are you, you know, other than text messages or WhatsApp, you know, um, what can we do? I think that's, uh, at that point, is meeting them where they're at because I'm not going to force my grandfather to get on Instagram and use something that he has no clue how to use just because that's where we are at, but giving them, adapting to them. So if I know I do have an older uh, 
demographic in my congregation, making sure we're also inclusive with them and giving them something. So my dad is really good with WhatsApp. He, he knows how to do the thing. And for me, I use WhatsApp to text my wife and that's it. But he knows how to do groups and, and devotion notes and group and all these things. I need to be able to give him something so he can fully harness his tool. So if, that, if that's something we know, if we're like, oh wait, 80% of our members are using WhatsApp, then, then we need to learn that tool to properly give them the content they need so they can use that tool properly. I am one of those older generation people and I do not use Facebook or Instagram. I consider myself savvy when it comes to electronics. I don't use it because they say join. And my fear is should I join, I'm suddenly going to get hit with 5,000 different uh, ads, uh, if not ads, uh, emails and what have you. So I don't use Facebook and I don't use Instagram. How can I use these tools without having to join and give them my personal information, my email, my phone number? Yeah. So uh, something I was working with a church, we, cr um, we were trying to create these kind of like, like business cards because we had, a, we had members like you that were like, well, I want to share what my church is doing, but I don't have social media. So we created these little like business cards that had a they had a QR code or had like a link on there. So let's say my sister, she was like my sister right here, she would be like, "Hey, I want to show you what my church is doing." Here's a little business card. Scan the code and you can follow my church on social media. So we're we're adapting to that generation. My sister doesn't have to be on social media to share what my church is doing because we're posting it on social media. So again, it's giving them the tools. We're adapting to them. And when you make those little business cards, I mean, you get, what, like a thousand for 9.99, I think. And you, you just make them, and the link just takes you to the homepage of the, either Facebook, the website, Instagram, whatever you want to link the link to. So, so that's one way to do it. Um, that I feel like that, that one has really worked and it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. There's no crazy science or math to it. Uh, yes, I see one. And I just lost track of time. I don't know how much time we have left. So I think this is the last question. What we found at Mount Home is that when we, um, during the pandemic, we did a lot of videos that helped people, like mental health videos or how-to videos for different things. Um, but now that church is back in full swing, like editing and shooting and all of that is kind of cumbersome. Do you have any like shortcuts to like creating content? Yes, so there's ways. Um Sometimes we really want to put in the time and the hours to make it beautiful and aesthetic and everything, but we also need to learn how to be efficient. And that is something that I've had to learn in my job because I am a one-man team that services 10 departments, 110 churches, and 20 schools. Wow. So I, need, I have had to find, so there's, there's times where I make phones, videos on my phone. I'm recording on my phone, I edit on my phone, and within, 30 minutes, that video's out. Now there's times where I do need to sit and take out the lights and the big cameras and do a full out production, but I do know that that takes more time. But most of the time is um, like the shortcuts, not being afraid of, of creating content with your phone, especially nowadays, it's, it's so normal, especially for social media, to create content with your phone. And we think, we think that that's informal, but it's become normal. Um, and I think uh, my time is up today. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you so much for, for your time. If you have any questions, I've, I know I've worked with some of your pastors. I might not have met you as members. I've met some of you at events, but 
your pastors have my contact. If you guys want me to come talk a little bit more about these or help your church find strategies to be more efficient, then have your pastor contact me and we can work on something. Praise the Lord. Let's give him another hearty amen. We, uh, he, we really appreciate Ernesto and, and the work he's done. He's been a blessing to us personally at Maranatha and helping us get set up. And so thank you, Ernesto. Appreciate you very much. And Delia, good to have you with us as well. Praise the Lord for them. At this time, um, our second presenter is here with us. Uh, and we're going to bring him up, Pastor Markey. Let's give him a hearty amen as he comes and shares with us about ways to engage. Praise the Lord. Yo, good afternoon. How y'all doing? Y'all good? Y'all was learning some good stuff about social media? I don't believe y'all. <laughs> y'all don't sound believable. So dig it. First and foremost, I want to thank um, Pastor Eugene Lewis. Can we just one more time celebrate him and his vision? Now, let me tell you, I, I got to be honest. I'm an honest person. In, 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 my latter, in my latter years, I've learned the policy of honesty gets you very far. And, and, and preachers, oftentimes, we get up and we lie. Yeah, no, no, no. Look, look, just stay with the preacher. I'm going somewhere. We get up and we lie, right? Because it's because it's appropriate to lie, right? So we get up and we. This this is the first lie we tell. Y'all ready? Good evening. It is good to be with you. I have come in the spirit, and that ain't that ain't who we are, right? So that was the first lie. Then we get up and we say things about the person who invited us. This mighty man of God. It's just, and it's not that he's not a man of God, but might is relative, feel me? Right? Mighty is very relative. <laughs> like, how mighty somebody is, I mean, like, how do we test that? Like, do we have him literally move the physical building? Like, what do we do to, to, to test and be sure that when we call him mighty, we didn't lie? Y'all don't want to talk back to me yet? <laughs> right? I, I just want to be honest with you. And, and I'm saying that as a, as a precursor to the fact that, I, and, and this is what you got pastor eugene right but eugene is just a good dude right like i, I don't got to go into his accolades i don't got to go into his resume he's a good dude and he's a friend of preachers right um and sometimes i see you other dueling so pretend like you stick, put your fingers in your ears don't listen to this part sometimes when you get in that ministration you forget what it was like to have been a pastor right and so then you start toe in the quote unquote company line. You know how it is. It was like that way. It was that way on your job. When you was working in like assembly line, you was mad at the man. When they promoted you, you was coming down on the people in the assembly line. It, it happens that way. Oh, I try to start off being honest. If y'all want to do the lion thing, we could do that too. First giving honor to God who is the Lord of my salvation and hope is built on nothing less. On Christ, the solid rock eyes. Y'all, okay, well, all right, let's, 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 let's keep it a stack up in here today. All right, so what I'm, what I'm tasked with doing, and I think they're, they're running a 150-foot cord for, to plug in my HDMI here. What, what I want to do today is I want to talk to us about some practical things to galvanize, because here, here, I don't want to go up there. Excuse me, sir. I don't want to go up there. You just moving it out of the shot? That's good videography. The man gonna just move it out the shot, right? Because we wanna get a good shot. All right, so look, what, what I'm here to do today is to talk to us about, and, and, and Pastor Nelson preached a powerful word. It's my, he, he in there sitting back. What, matter of fact, Hans, tell, tell him that I said under his preaching to come on in here. <laughs> to, <laughs> tell, tell him I said under, no, not, not, now let me tell y'all, just be honest with you, right? So I'm in the middle of a 40 day fast. Um, and on two days ago, Pastor Lewis, and see, then I got to say Pastor Lewis, like if, when I call him, he, he very straight, he called me, hey, look, uh, man, uh, 
you're going to come in and you're going to do this thing. And uh, all right. Yo, doc, you know, when you call, I'm going to come. All right, cool. That was it. <laughs> it was a conversation. Eugene, am I lying, Eugene? He don't, have to, he don't have to do the pretense. Hey, this is Pastor Eugene Lee. Hey, what's up, man? Look, you're going to come up here. You're going to do this thing for me, right? All right, cool. I'm there. Um, but, but what I want to do is I, I, I need us to, 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 to refocus and reshuffle our thinking because Pastor Nelson said a number of important things today. And he talked about how um, Seattle Seahawks, if they were to pull this upset, what y'all would behave like. Right. And then he talked about the 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 discrepancies, if you will, in how we and what we give to God. He, he, he spoke about how the man of God has to stand up and beg us to do ministry. And I told him because that's my man. So I told I, uh, I'm got to keep doing this. Pastor Lewis, Pastor Lewis, I told Greg, I'm Pastor Nelson, because this is this. This is like the, what, the third time we've done this, Greg, where Greg ends up doing something before me in a conference. Right. So he'll come in and he'll preach and then I'll come in and I'll teach. And I, I want to preach, too. Ain't nobody on the organ. Ain't no praise team. What if I want to preach? You ain't know, you know, let me preach. That's right. I want to preach. I can preach a little bit. Right. But this has happened to several times where, where Pastor Nelson comes in and he does. And, and, and I told him this when he called me, you know, when we found out we were going to be doing this one together. I said, man, we just need to start making this a ticket. Right, you got to bring us both in, you know what I'm saying? I will start making a lot more money because his engagements are way more voluminous than mine are. <laughs> right, but, um, but, 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 but here was the thing. Um, I told him, I said, look, man, you going to make him happy, then I'm going to make him mad. <laughs> I don't lie. I say true things. That's what I told him. Um, because we have an elder, elder Doolin, Joe, literally, and let me tell you what, I was down here in, under conviction. I'm, okay, boom, go back. All right. Um, so I'm on a 40-day fast. Three days ago, I woke up, had my devotion, as he talked about, right? Um, and the Lord gave me in the book of John when Jesus is standing before Pilate. And Pilate is trying to convince Jesus to save himself. And Jesus says... You have no power over me, save it was given you from above. And the Lord said to me, he said, Marquise, anything that's happening to you, I have already weighed and I know it won't crush you. Right. So that was my devotion. And the next day, the Lord woke me up with a particular pastor on my mind. Right. He took and I'm, I'm, y'all know I'm kind of just buying him time. Um, and he's doing a good job, man. Thank you, bro. No, absolutely not. Under no circumstance. All right, thank you very much. You're kind. I'm not just patronizing you. I, I, don't, I say true things. If I didn't have nothing nice to say, I just would be quiet. Um, so the Lord put a particular preacher on my heart, and I was going to ignore him, right? I was going to ignore the, what the Lord was saying. Because, come on, we ignore God. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure we're in here together. Don't make me start telling you what you ignored him about. I can look at y'all, some of y'all, and tell you where you've been ignoring him. Amen. Right? And so I was about to ignore him, but then I call another pastor friend of ours, and um, he's like, yo, man, because uh, I'm, off, I'm off of social media, right? And I, I'm, I'm a t where, where my guy go? Did he leave? I don't blame him. Um, uh, I'm off of social media for 40 days as well, right? So I'm talking to my guy, and he's like, yo, I mean, we're just talking about preachers because we, you know, we like to talk about preachers, not in a bad way, but who's, who can get down. You know what I mean? Like, like, we all know Greg can get down, right? We know Greg can get down. And so um, he's like, yeah, man, so, you know, Henry Wright is da 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 And he's like, yo, you know he just took a church. You know, did you know he took a church? Interim pastor at Beltsville in, um, in Maryland, right? And so if y'all know Henry Wright, Henry Wright says some outlandish things to people. So he told them, he told them this Sabbath, Eugene, he said, now, y'all know him. Now, I don't, my sermons are too good to preach to empty rooms. Go get the people. 
Amen. And, they, and it, that was, that's what he told the people, right? So, so my guy is telling me, man, he's, he's talking about right and how right slayed this Sabbath. He's like, yo, he killed, he killed, he slayed, right? And then in that moment, the Lord says, I told you to call him. Now, Henry Wright did my premarital counseling and conducted my, ma my, my wedding. You know, you got to be careful. He married me. <laughs> right? So, 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 he, so, I, so I call him up, and he's straight. Hello? I say, hey, Elder Wright, it's, it's Keith, man. Mm-hmm. And like five minutes into the conversation, he says, now remind me who you are. <laughs> Elder Wright, uh, uh, me, Marquise, you know, you just, uh, oh, okay, yes, uh, now I'm tracking with you. And so we go through the thing, and he says something to me, I, you know, I can't share this, but he says something that left me under heavy conviction. And after he finished saying, he says, I'm done. <laughs> he said, I'm telling y'all the truth. I say true things, so I'm done. I say, yo, you know, I do the pleasantries. The lion I told y'all earlier, I started doing, oh, man, thank you for that word. I really appreciate it. I didn't. I did not. I did not. I mean, and it wasn't that he said anything bad. He just said true things, right? And everything that's not that's good for you isn't always good to you, right? Some things, medicine sometimes tastes nasty going down. Remember that because I'm about to make y'all mad in about five minutes, <laughs> right? We ready? Let me know you're ready. Okay. Um, I'm going to put it in share mode so that you don't, so we don't got to do that. There it goes. Um... And so, so, uh, so, 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 boom. So I get off the phone with him, and I'm under heavy conviction. I mean, like, the kind of conviction where I, like, you got to call your therapist afterwards. <laughs> so I call my therapist. <laughs> oh, y'all just wear the t shirts. Y'all don't really believe you can have Jesus and a therapist. I have a therapist. So I call my therapist to process this conversation, right? And so, boom, that was my devotion yesterday. So this morning, I get up, and we, uh, our colleagues in here know that we lost a colleague, um, and it's sad. Uh, great guy, great, great guy. If you knew him, I mean, you may not, like, again, you don't always agree with people, but he was a great, great guy. And, um, and so I woke up early to that news, so I turned on and so grabbed my Bible, and I decided this 40 days as I do my devotion, I'm not going to a devotional book, I'm going to my Bible. All right, so I pull up my Bible, and where I've anchored myself, I felt led, the Lord, I felt that the Lord led me to anchor myself in the last moments of the life of Christ. You know, Ellen White says, uh, we should contemplate the closing moments of Christ, right? We should contemplate the life of Christ, especially the closing moments. And so that's why so I went to Matthew to read that last thing. And Matthew uh, 28, it says, it makes a very interesting statement. It says, um, and, the, and the 11 departed unto the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And the Lord arrested my attention, right? And he arrested my attention and he, and he said to me, I bring you to mountains, to obstacles, to obstructions, but that's where I meet you, right? God, God meets us at our mountains. And so this, this, he know I'm pointing at him too. Because <laughs> we talked about it. He and I went to, and, and so he's preaching and he's, he's literally, he's the, the number 40 is coming up, which is the amount of days I'm fasting. He talked about mountains. He talked about change, which is what the preacher told me. And, I'm, and, and I just, I had to go down and weep at the altar right here. And, you know, some of you may have been confused as to why I was walking out as you guys were being called up is because I needed to process for myself. You know, as pastors, we don't often get the opportunity to just process when God is t talking to us. We have to put on a public face and, you know, we can't, we can't answer the appeal about pornography. Right? We, we can't answer the appeal about broken marriages. We have to stand back and look all strong and let, let y'all get that deliverance, let y'all get that grace, let y'all get that mercy. And we have to, like Nicodemus, which is an interesting point about Nicodemus, we have to get ours in secret at night. So that when we have a fall, all the 
parishioners do. Right? Um, so I'm sorry I had to, I had to as y'all come in, I had to walk out. Um, and he also says something else that is going to prep for what I'm going to talk to y'all about. What do I do with this thing? Give me that. There you go. Thank you, Hans. Um, uh, he, he talked about, uh, phew. He talked about the Passover, which I felt was also very timely and providential because I'm going to anchor us in Acts chapter 2, which is Pentecost. And, and so I want to, I want to move through a couple of things. I, it's it's going to be very practical. Um, I don't, I, I now travel doing lectures and seminars on church growth and diversity, equity, and inclusion. I also work as the content manager, content and production manager for an entity called the Conference of National Black Churches. The Conference of National Black Churches is the caucusing body of the six black denominations in America. We have six historically black denominations in America, and it has given me a vantage point where I'm able to look. Um, what I was telling you earlier is as I was praying, my phone started buzzing, and I went into the office, and it was Joe McCoy calling me. <laughs> and, um, and, and I was telling him how my, I've been working with them for two years now, and it's given me a lens through which to see how we could do things differently in our church, right? We have, we have so under the auspices and guise of being different and coming out of Babylon, missed many opportunities to minister to the marginalized amongst us, right? Um, and my vantage point now allows me to see uh, some things that we could be doing differently. And when um, my dear friend Eugene called me and asked me to come, I was like, okay, I got you. And so uh, let's pray. Father, help us lest we perish. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I do is I use analytics to help organization harness every member's unique energy and talent, irrespective of their age, their sexual orientation, um, irrespective of their age, their sexual orientation. Um, I want to harness everybody's energy and talent, irrespective of their sexual orientation. Yeah, and I'm anchoring there because everybody can be used of God. If you don't believe that, you don't read the Bible, right? And, and we, have, we have majored, as the preacher said, in so many minors uh, that we have uh, alienated individuals who have the capacity and the passion to minister, but because they don't conform to some things that we've allowed society to tell us, we don't utilize their unique giftings. And so I specialize in harnessing everyone's gift and talent, irrespective of age, irrespective of gender, race, ethnicity, disability status, sexual orientation, religion, functional background, and or education. And so what I do is I use analytics, I use data. And today I wanna to take you through a couple of things. The first thing I wanna do in order to, to harness our collective and individual uh, passions is I wanna to talk to you first about some cautions and some counsels, some cautions and some counsels. Then I wanna explain the term koinonia. I wanna talk about koinonia. We, we, say, we say church, we say uh, 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 sanctuary, temple, but, but the reality is the New Testament church participated in a thing called koinonia. And I, I want to I I <laughs> break down koinonia and show us how we have put some distance between us and what we do here and koinonia. I found because some of, my, some of my good friends pastor some of the largest churches in America and the consistent lament is their pastoring these large churches gives their members the ability to hide in the pews, right? When you have 30,000 people, you always have 20% of the people doing 80% of the work, which means in a church where you have 30,000 members, 80% of those people sneak in and sneak out and never introduce anyone to Christ. So I want to talk about koinonia, and then I want to talk about church and community. Church and community, and, and, and there are three things I want to show us about church and community. Church and community, um, there are churches in communities, there are churches to communities, and there are churches with communities. There are churches in communities, churches to communities, and churches with communities. And I'm sure that the majority of you here are from Mount Tahoma, but for my pastors who pastor the other churches in the area and members who are attending from other churches in the area, I want us to begin to process and think about which church our church is. 
whether you're at Emerald City, Mount Tahoma, Breath of Life, whichever church you're at, because I, I pull statistics, I pull demographics, yeah. right? Demographics and psychographics. Everybody knows what demographics are. Everybody knows demographics. Demographics is who we are. Psychographics is what we like. So when dealing with members and when dealing with church and when dealing with organizations, you can't just know who they are. You have to know what they like. And the evidence suggests that people no longer like church. Because we're giving them what we like. Right? So, so there's a particular young lady in this congregation right now. I won't say who it is. I won't say who it is. I was taught as rude the point. I don't want to say who it is. But this particular young lady, one time when I was visiting here, she told me she had made dessert. Now, I said to her, my favorite dessert is peach cobbler. She said, is that not only are we bald and wear glasses. <laughs> right? I said, I said, Peach Cobbler. She said, oh, you know, she had that. I don't want to say that it was arrogant, but she kind of did that like, huh, oh, you do, do you? <laughs> well, come, let me show you something. <laughs> right? And, and, and here's the thing. I love Peach Cobbler so much. I like a bad Peach Cobbler. Now, that's not to say she, she made an excellent Peach Cobbler. Come on, somebody say amen. If you haven't had it, that's because you're not saved. If you were saved, you might have had her peach cobbler. Now, we know that I am saved because I've had it. Amen to everybody. Right? Now, here's the thing. I could have told, oh, come on, Holy Spirit. I could have, when I shared that with her, she could have said, oh, you do? And then when I showed up at the house, giving me some pumpkin pie. Because she really believes she has a great pumpkin pie recipe. Y'all don't want to talk back to me. But instead, she listened to me. She saw who I was, demography, and what I liked, psychography. And when I got to the house, there wasn't a pumpkin pie. And I used pumpkin on purpose instead of sweet potato because had it been a pumpkin, we would have had some other problems. <laughs> pumpkin is a vegetable. Oh, no vegetable pie. Right? I didn't, and, and, and so, so here's the thing. And in and, and that moment, when I walked in here, I say true things. When I walked in here, I greeted her husband. I greeted all the preachers, everybody. And I asked her, what I asked you? Wait, hold, watch this. What I asked you, Sister Lewis? Uh, did you make me a peach cobbler? <laughs> See, I, for real. Because she made good peach cobbler. And in route here, the possibility that I might get something I like Demography versus psychography. All right? All right, so, so I want to talk about are we churches into, with communities. Then I want to final, finally talk about how to be in constant contact with, 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 with the communities that we exist in. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father, help us lest we perish. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me see something. I got a couple of notes in here. Um, don't preach it, though. Or give me credit. Can I get credit? If you're going to preach it, can I get credit? Um, let me see if I... Uh, oh, yeah, there it is. So let me see. I'm telling you, what you might want to do is just pay somebody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, I first want to talk about this, this concept of koinonia. Um, and... I'm going to try to move this. I don't think I have access to my notes. So, so let's, let's, let's anchor ourselves in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And let me challenge you today. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Um, Father in heaven, again, I ask that you would just take my crazy um, self and, and let it not be a hindrance to anyone receiving what they must receive from you on today. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts 2, 42. If you have Acts chapter, don't, don't. It may be up here, but you may not be able to see it. Um, so I would like for you to look at it in your Bible, on your phone. Um, the Bible says, and they continued, watch this, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And what's that word? Fellowship. Fellowship. That is the word koinonia, actually. 
And in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things in common. That word is also koinonia. Now koinonia is literally interpreted fellowship, right? And the New Testament church practiced koinonia, fellowship, breaking of bread together. Right. And and not only that, but it's fellowship, the common life, close association, communion, close relationship, sharing the phrase they were devoting themselves to fellowship. Watch this is also translated is also translated. They were like family to each other. And and let me let me let me be very honest here on how we have tried to uh, uh, take advantage of this concept without actually leaning into being family to one another. We come in here every Sabbath for those of us who come every Sabbath, and we say, hey, brother so-and-so, and and, hey, sister, what's your name, right? But, but, But beyond using that phrase, brother and or sister, we know nothing about them. I know, Greg Nelson is my brother. I could tell you his, and he out the room, so I could really tell y'all his business. All right, sh- lean in. Let me tell y'all. So I, I know, like, you know, y'all were probably, you know, he was sharing some things about what he went through. I was there real time. Because that's my brother. Right? And, 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 and we are like family. You know, this noun denotes an association involving close, watch this, watch this, watch this word, mutual relations and in what? Involvement. The reality is the reason why we can't reach the community and bring them into fellowship because we aren't in close mutual relations and involvement here in the church. I told you I came to make y'all a little bit mad. Right. We, we have to be honest. We have to be honest, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends of my beloved. We have to be honest about the fact that here's the truth. I don't like some of the people I go to church with. All right, I'm talking to seven day Adventists, right? Heads. So we have this doctrine. What? Let me out here. It is quiz time. Y'all ready? I don't have a script. Y'all can tell. What is the unique doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist church? Hand, don't scream out at me, because I'll run. Yes. No. Wait, no, let me, I'm sorry. That was, that was a good answer. But it wasn't the right one. Yes, me. You think Adventists are the only ones that believe that? Now, we got Peach Cobbler in common. Back there in the back. sanctuary and she says something else we won't repeat but sanctuary saying <laughs> because we want to stay biblical amen everybody right so she said sanctuary so now let's talk sanctuary we go to church hear what i said we go to church with one another and the reality is many of us don't even like the people we worship with now 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 let me show you why god cannot bless that now the preacher I, and he, he's so good i could just use his sermon to do my stuff right <laughs> So, so the preacher talked about today this concept that we have read into scripture called Shekinah, right? The Shekinah glory. Now, what was the setting in order for the Shekinah glory to produce itself? There was this thing called the. There was this thing called the. Thank you. Ark of the, we already got the sanctuary. That was good, though. That was good. The Ark of the. Now, let's describe, come on, good Seventh-day Adventists, let's describe the Ark of the Covenant. If you want to and you need help, Exodus 26 will give you some stuff you need. All right, so here it is. There was this box of shittim wood overlaid with gold. There, t- so I was going to wear my Crocs because she got on Crocs. So this, she did, she, you did good. Watch this. Now, t- say what you just said. The, chi- the, the two angels, the seraphim and mm-hmm. the cherubim. And what were they doing? They were covering over. And doing what to one another? were bowing down yeah that's good the 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 angels over the the ark of covenant had their wings touching and they faced one another we come to church and worship together unable to truly face one another and wonder why the shekinah glory is not falling more often That's internally, and then we wonder why we can't get the community in our churches no mutual relations and or involvement. 
And what inevitably happens, and many of you who have been in the church for decades know this happened, we bring somebody in the church and they get adopted into a particular clique and they take on our proclivities and our issues with the other people we don't like. And we wonder why God isn't showing up more regularly in our church services. Misnomer if I ever heard one. Right. So 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 koinonia koinonia is what I want to bring us back to, because I believe. Hello, Holy Spirit. I believe that God is looking for a new iteration of what we call church. And because Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun, I think what he's calling us back to. And he went to great pains to get our attention so much so that he shut this down. See, I told you I could just use the preacher stuff. He shut this down. And said, now, what you going to do in your kitchen and in your bathroom? Right? Because he's inviting us into fellowship. Now, now, koinonia. Now, here's the thing. Because of what we've done, one could argue, one could argue that this concept of koinonia, based on a reading, a literal, a fundamentalist reading of Acts chapter 2, one could argue that this concept of koinonia was limited to those who had already and would become Christian. However... We must consider this in the context of two things. First and foremost, John chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, For God so that he, that whosoever should, should not perish but have. Now, it's verse 17. See, only the preachers, and and it's these righteousness by faith preachers too. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now watch this thing. Come on, Holy Ghost. We have set ourselves up as the chief arbiters of judgment and have a message where we feel justified in calling people out of Babylon, not knowing that Babylon is not only a system outside there, your own psych physiological ecosystem can be Babylon. Preacher, you need to make that plain. Some of us are a walking, talking, living ball of confusion. Right? And we, and we, we, skip, over, we, we skip over the fact that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And, and contrary to popular belief, that text, that text, <laughs> stop being a preacher. Um, so, so contrary to popular belief, uh, there's, a, there's an author who wrote a book called Character of the Lord's Witness, and he said three things, Elder Dooling. He said you have to listen to what's being said, what's not being said, and what the Spirit is saying. So with that in mind, let me tell you what John 3.16 didn't say. <laughs> it didn't say, for God so loved the Adventist church. It said, for God so loved the world. Now, here's the problem. When we come out, and I, love, I used to love this because I, 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 Elder Eugene, he knows it. I used to be ultra, super, hyper, duper conservative, right? And everything was the world, the world, the world, the world, right? And when I came out, the world, into the church... Somewhere in the revolving door of coming out of the world into the church, I lost grace. Preacher, what do you mean? The grace that was afforded me while I was in the world ran out just in time for me to get in the church. <laughs> now, nobody else, I was, I was, <laughs> I was sitting talking with my father in law a couple of weeks ago in Florida, and we were joking, but I was dead serious. I was like, man, I used to go to churches as a Seventh-day Adventist because of the the, the unique slant of Adventism I was introduced to. And I walk in, and I see a brother, if your shoes wasn't shine, in my mind, I say, oh, you're going to hell. (laughs) No, it was was simple. It was simple. Your shoes aren't shine, you're going to hell. How could you... You, you know, and here's why, because in volume six of the testimonies, Ellen White says, one hour before the Sabbath, shoes should be, so your shoes ain't shine, you wasn't ready one hour before you going to hell. I'm talking about eisegesis, <laughs> right? Because there's no more love for the world. Our churches have love for good music. 
We got love for good preaching. We got love for our auxiliaries or our various ministries. But love for the world is strangely absent. Because there is no more koinonia, no more fellowship. Not only do I want you to take this into consideration in the context of John chapter 3 verse 16, but notice Acts 2 verse 8. But you shall receive what? Power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. Say it with me everybody and unto the Well, I mean, the address here is not the uttermost parts of the earth. You don't get brownie points for your regular church attendance. Have you gone into the uttermost parts of the world driven by a love for those who Christ came not to condemn, but came to show compassion? Koinonia. So we have, now, now I'm going to challenge y'all. Like, <laughs> I'm going to mess y'all up today. The preacher said a lot. So I was listening to the sermon. I, I, can I tell him? I, even though I heard it before. It was better this time because I was convicted. See, as friends, let me tell you another thing preachers do. I know, hear me out. I know if none of y'all shout, because I know how hard what he did today is. Oh, I'm going to shout him. Work, boy! Work! Preacher! Reverend! You better preach, Gregory! That's hard work up there. And many members leave the church. I'm going to say, oh, pastor didn't have a word today. Oh, well, I'm glad we brought in this, 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 now this is a preacher. What do you, what, 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 what does that mean? Right? Nobody can tell y'all how we feel. Right? The uttermost parts, now here it is, I'm about to mess y'all up. We have made ecclesia, why, oh God, Ooh. Holy Spirit right now, I need you to tend to some hearts. We have made Ecclesia fit our definition of curia K. However, what she would we should be striving for is koinonia. Break that down, preacher. Now, when you read the Bible, because you didn't do what we had to do, heads, doc. <laughs> now, they forced us. Hans, Milan, son, you rest in peace. You know, Milan, right? They forced us into Greek and Hebrew. I hated every minute of it, right? But because I have a lot of student loan debt that says I took it, every now and then I make it work for me. <laughs> so I had to put that up there so I could seem smart as well as get banged for my proverbial buck. Y'all don't want to talk back to me, okay. So here's the thing. When, when, when I read the scriptures, I see this word church often, right? Church. And when I go into my, my Greek, the word is variations of ecclesia, right? Now, let me help y'all out. Let me see, how much can I push y'all today? Oh, don't do it. <laughs> Eugene, you know don't tell me that. <laughs> All right, so dig it. Um, I'm trying to think of a word. So, so the preacher said today in his sermon, all the way up, right? And y'all heard me. I said, all the way up. Nothing can stop me. I'm okay, good. I know who I'm talking to. Now, we all know what all the way up mean. Right now, now in, 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 in the church world, y'all know what all the way up mean. See, all the way up mean is when I go in the club, I'm not drinking one bottle. All the way up mean when I pull a girl, I'm not just trying to pull one girl. All the way up, all the way up is turnt, or, you know, like turnt. There, that's the better one. Turn, no, it ain't turned up no more. See, that shows our age. Matter of fact, the young people ain't even use turnt no more. Right? They ain't, the young folks ain't even turnt. They, we say that, they be like, y'all old. Right? Turnt. So turnt 
contextually, when you hear that, you think one thing, a young person thinks a completely different thing. You think, oh, she turned around and went back home. No. And over time, when we adopt these colloquialisms, make my education work for me. Right? When we adopt them and read them back into not just popular vernacular, but into the, into, like when, when, when uh, Nicki Minaj started saying fleek. And then dictionaries started to print versions of it with the word fleek in there as a verb and its meaning. All of a sudden, this word took on meaning that it didn't originally have. So let's talk about ecclesia. <laughs> call out. It's a compound Greek word. means to call out. But see, what it, it's, what it was originally used for in the Greek language was a political gathering. Called out to the public square so we can decide things for our province. We then took what we think is church and read it into that word. The word church only appears twice in all of the scriptures in the Greek. It's in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it is a Greek word, kuriake. Now, you know Revelation 1.10 because we good Adventists. And it says that I was in the spirit on the? That word is kuriake. It's not the Lord's Day. It's not Domingo, what we try to make it like Sunday. It's not that. It's Korea K, and Korea K morphed over time to the Greek word Kirke, which then morphed into the English word. So the concept of church that we're reading into Ecclesia really is only found in Korea K. And it is the Lord's thing. The Lord's thing. Right. So we're trying to make. Oh, come on, Holy Ghost. We're trying to make Ecclesia Korea K. We've tried to make this calling out for political information gathering into the Lord's thing. When what we should be striving for is koinonia. Fellowship. Whether you call me out in to the curb, to the house, to the bottom, wherever we at. Where two or three are gathered. So, so, so now, 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 now that we've established koinonia, I just wanted to see mutual, mutual. That's what we need to do. I just, blah, 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 blah. Um, counsel, counsel and caution. Now, um, you know, they say the new preachers, we don't, we don't conform to the old standards. And I am intentional about everything I do because I'm often called to our spaces, Adventist spaces, which are heavily influenced by conservative white supremacy. Um, what? 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 I better stop saying that stuff and putting it in here. So I, and so what I do is I intentionally, I like, Eugene know, he know. He tell you up here, oh, my mentor. Lies he tells. I got Magnani shoes. I got tailor-made suits. I, I can't wear them all because, you know, what? I'm not out of shape. Round is a shape. <laughs> talk about, I'm in shape. <laughs> I'm in shape. Round is a shape. That's what I learned. That's what I taught my daughter. Right? Now, I can't wear them suits no more, which caused my wife to tell me I can't buy no more because she knows what we paid for them. She said, you wear a suit, you're going to get no suits. Because I can't after, you know, functional buttons and all. I can't go back to the regular stuff. But, 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 but here's the thing. But here's the thing. I, I, I go to churches now. I get invited to churches and I show up. I show up exactly like this. Oh, no, not like that. Because I knew exactly what you was talking about. So let me do this. Let me do this back. 
I show up to church, it's just like this. I have on a dashiki, some Jordans. I know y'all see it. These Kari shells, right? My Jasper. And this one right here, this, this brown, reddish brown one, this has all of my children's names on them, right? This one right here says Memento Mori. This is my life's motto. Memento Mori is Latin for remember you will die. I never forget I'll die. That way I always remember to live. Amen. Right? And then this here is red, yellow, and green because while I'm a Christian, I'm a Pan-Africanist. Right? So nothing that I'm wearing is just by happenstance. The dashiki is to celebrate the fact that I'm not black. Black is a construct created to prop up white supremacy. There's no such thing as black. Everybody in here is African. You may be an African from Haiti, an African from Bermuda, an African from wherever you're from. If you look like me, you're African, right? But we have subscribed to, they created the construct of whiteness in order to determine who would have citizenship in the United States of America. And if there was going to be white, because Western civilization, con the concept of dualism means there has to be a good and a bad. So when they created white as the ultimate realization of good, they had to have a black, the ultimate realization of bad. They propped up masculinity as the ultimate manifestation of good along with white and put out the opposite end of the spectrum, femininity. Black female is the worst thing that could ever happen to a white man. How so? Because if a black woman is impregnated by a white man, she's going to give him a black baby. And what they are struggling with right now is the fear of genetic annihilation. But that's another lecture for another time. So counsel and caution. And I said all that to say I love standing up here looking like this in my Jordans, my twos. My twos. I just pulled them out the boxes before I came here, heads. I did, I did. Hans over there pressing me. You got the twos? I wanted the twos. What size is those? I said, Hans, man, roll up off of me, man. Let me live, doc. Let me live. Let me be, let me be fly for a second. Mm. Have my moment. So that when I do this, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, this word dwelling here is the one that throws us off. And this is the one that we derive a lot of our philosophies for church growth from. And I want to take it and turn it on its ear. These people weren't just those who lived in Jerusalem. Pentecost is a time of pilgrimage. So there were people in Jerusalem who had trekked from other places. Stay with the preacher. I'm going somewhere. So on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and Peter preached and 3,000 were baptized, no motion was taken to found the first church of Jerusalem. People went back where they came from with the teachings they heard, became incarnational, and participated in koinonia. They did not try to erect ecclesia. Right? So, so, so when, they, when, they, when they came to Jerusalem, Peter preached, baptized 3,000 people, mostly men, who then did what? Men made their, their pilgrimages up to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Then they went home and were the centers of their families. And so the primary evangelists during this time were men who had been converted in Jerusalem who went back home, not starting churches, but first wove those teachings into the hearts and minds of their children. Koinonia. <laughs> Right? So, so, so here, here, what, you ready? Ba bump. All right. There's another reason why I dress like this. Because I like doing this. I like pulling up, you know, Auntie Ellen. People don't be thinking I'll do that. They think I got beef with Auntie Ellen. Yo, she dope. The problem is, somebody then cherry picked Auntie Ellen and made y'all dislike her. But if you read her in context, 
Shorty be saying some stuff. <laughs> like, 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 for instance, this right here has. There are times. Now, I'm a preacher. I mean, not, not this kind of preacher. Don't get it twisted. I can say some things, but I ain't going to do that. I mean, you ain't, did you sweat, Greg? I'm sweating now. I don't believe you. Yeah, but, but I, be, I sweat everywhere. Where? There are times when it is fitting. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to choke you. There are times when it is fitting for our ministers to give on the Sabbath in our churches. Y'all not ready? Short discourses. I, I go places and I preach and I tell them, I'll be like, look, my sermon is really one point. I could be done in 10 minutes, but y'all would be mad at me. So I got to do these things, jump around, tell stories, make y'all laugh to fill up the 30 minutes you've allotted for a sermon. I really just want to tell you, stop sinning or you're going to go to hell. All right, peace. <laughs> but then the preacher going to be like, man, I paid for a plane ticket, a hotel. You better get back up there and say something else. All right, listen, look. Short discourses full of life and love of Christ. Short discourses full of 2,300 days. Short discourses on the seven heads of Revelation 18. Short discourses on the gap theories, inadequacies, and proving what... Short discourses full of the life and love of Christ. But the church... are not to expect a sermon I can't pay for it, I'm poor. <laughs> my Jordans. All right. A text taken out of context is pretext for proof text. So let's give you context. I'm not done. She goes on to say, when God's people see the great need of working as Christ worked for the conversion of sinners, the testimonies borne by them in the Sabbath service will be filled with power. Yeah. Let, me, let me tell you. Let, imagine this. Imagine. Let's focus. Watch this. Imagine, hey, we met here at like 9 in the morning. Y'all with me? Tracking? Come on, come on, come on. Y'all tracking? We met, are y'all tracking with me or not? Okay. We met here at 9 in the morning. We got into groups. All right? Now, one group went down to the homeless shelter. A group of wives went down to the battered women's shelter. <clears throat> Another group of people went to uh, the HIV ward and the burn ward. And you spent about two hours there. Now, I know some of us are married to raggedy Negroes. <laughs> but after we spend an hour in the battered women's shelter, <clears throat> the worship in here, I know some of us, you know, HMS Richard said, if the barn is ugly, paint it. <laughs> but if you spend an hour in the burn war, the worship in here. Do you understand what I'm saying? We come in here, we come in here on Sabbath expecting a sermon. Not coming here having realized that my husband may not be all I want him to be, but he ain't never raised his hand to me. God, I lift my hand to worship. Look, look y'all going to mess up. I'm going to tap in my hooper. Look, I'm not done. Context. Let church members win. Say it till you believe. Act their part faithfully. I don't, you, not acting your part faithfully during the week is not going to be undone by you singing the, the song Faithful and saying Faithful a hundred times when the praise team singing on Sabbath. <laughs> faithful, faithful. No, it's not going to work. You got to act your part faithfully during the, meet, during the week 
and, and, and on the Sabbath relate that experience. Right? The meeting will then be as meat in due season, bring into all. See, see, then the, the praise and worship team and say, come on, y'all, get up on your feet and give God some glory. Come on, the pastor ain't got to say, I'm going to give you a moment right here to worship God. Come on, somebody clap your hands. Come on, somebody, you ain't got to do none of that. Some, some, the preacher man had to get him and say, okay, wait, wait, calm down. I, I wrote a sermon today. Right? But wait, there's more. I, I'm still in, this is, this is volume nine of the testimonies. <laughs> it weakens. It weakens those who know the truth. For our ministers to expend on them the time and talent that should be given to the unconverted. In many of our churches in the cities, the minister preaches Sabbath after Sabbath and Sabbath after Sabbath. The church members come to the house of God with no words to tell of blessings received because of blessings imparted. They have not worked during the week to carry out the instruction given them on the Sabbath. Watch this. So long as church members make no effort to give to others the help given them, great spiritual feebleness must We could say the churches ain't full because the music ain't good. We could say the churches ain't growing because the preachers ain't the preacher preachers. We, we, we could say the buildings is falling apart. We could say we don't have enough money. We could say all of that. But let me tell y'all something. It took 12 men less than half a decade to turn the world upside down. And they ain't had no building. They ain't had no lights, they ain't had no screens, they ain't had no Hammonds, they ain't had no none of that. But what they had was during the week, an experience with Jesus. And they fellowshiped. Ladies and gentlemen, friends of mine, beloved of God, I need you to get this in your spirit and get it deep down in there. Our churches are struggling because... We have no concept of psychography, demography, psychography. We don't know what they want because we ain't talking to them. So now let's talk about church and community. And think about this, y'all. How do you think the people who live in the neighborhood around your church would identify it? They can't even brought this very popular cliche. If your church was gone tomorrow, who would miss it? Right? How would they describe your church? Some places would describe you as blocking their ability to park. Can't park nowhere. Because on Saturday, Right? Now, 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 here, now, here, here. Let me give you the three, the three verses. <clears throat> J. J uh, Van, Van Gronen, Groningen said three ways in which churches exist in the under-resourced community. A church in, to, and with the community. Let's work. Let's work. Look, a church in a community is a fortress. Lowers its drawbridge once a week. Invites people in. Oh, God, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, Jesus, oh, yeah, Lord. Oh, my God, I'm so convicted. I'm not going to sin no more. Okay. <laughs> Drawbridge closes. Nobody sees you until next week. <laughs> there may as well be a moat around <laughs> with a dragon in the waters. <laughs> Ready to consume anyone who doesn't have on the right attire. 
churches in the community. Now, let me show you what that is. It does not desire to influence the community. And, and, and I'm a, as we work through these three, you'll see what I mean by that. Because I'm going to say, yeah, we do want to influence the community. We want to influence the community to like what we like. Right? It does not desire the community members to influence it. Psychography. Psychography. Mess that word up. Now I sound like I ain't educated. We don't want the church, the people coming in here telling us, I, like, Lord have mercy, I wasn't in the church early, but I could have Elder Doolin and, and Nate, I'm sorry, <laughs> come here and tell y'all stories of what it was like back in the days to have that thing up there. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, but if I, if, I, if I can park here parenthetically for a moment and deposit something in your spirits that is more about cultural than Christianity, uh, there was this thing called the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina in 1739. Y'all know about this thing? All right, so, so <laughs> Stono Rebellion in 1739, a bunch of South Carolinian slaves heard that there was a group of Europeans offering freedom to anybody who can get to Florida. So they just gathered together, got some weapons, and started killing white folk. And they killed white folk from South Carolina all the way until they got stopped somewhere in Alabama. Y'all still with the preacher? Right, all the way, and this, I'm, 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 just, I'm just telling the story the way the story is. This, this is what happened. Right, so they start, and so they finally caught him, killed everybody. All of the people in the Stoner Rebellion got killed. So the very next year in South Carolina, they enacted the first slave law, laws. So the first slave laws, the Negro Act of 1740 is what it was called. This is, on, I'm, this is true history. I ain't making this up. In 1740, the first Negro Act Laws passed in South Carolina banned three things from black people. Number one, gathering in groups. Number two, making too much noise. Number three, huh? What? What? I, I'm just, I just, I saw something up here I wanted to pick up off the ground. That's not true. I got to say true things. No, they banned drums. So now, 1740, in South Carolina, they banned black people gathering in groups, making too much noise, and drums, among other things. Our denomination was founded in, come on for, come on somebody, come on, 1844. That's 100 and what? Four years later. The same thing I said we've done with ecclesia, we did with drums. We read culture into our churches, which is why the AMEs, the Kojiks, the CMEs, the Baptists, the National Baptists, and the Progressive Baptists finally decided they had to step away because they realized a lot of things that were being told you needed to do to be holy were actually culture that had been codified into Christianity, which has led one author to say sometimes Christianity is really the attempt to Europeanize people. Now we don't, no, no, no. Let's, not, let's not get into a conversation because I don't, I don't got time for the pseudo, the pseudo woke who want to reject Christianity. I will have you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> I'm a Pan-Africanist, but I'm a Christian. Don't play with me, right? And, and, and so we, we don't want the community to come in here and tell us, hey, this is what will work if you want us to be here. Because we came out from among them and were separate. Right? And, and so, so not only do we not, not desire to influence the community or want the community to influence us, we invest efforts and resources only on members. I got a friend who pastors a very large church in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. It's a non-denominational black church. And they... You have a lot of money, a whole lot, a lot, lot, like kind of like some conference budgets money. But let me tell you what they do, because every Sunday in Upper Marlboro, traffic is back to back. You, you, you know what I'm talking about? Right? Back to back traffic at this church in Upper Marlboro. Nobody in the community ch 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 complains. 
Police show up and give escorts. People wait patiently as they get into church and come out of church. Nobody complains. Ask me why. Because they tithe 10% of what they bring to the community. And their 10%. <laughs> I mean, the pastor flies himself where he goes. This is the kind of stuff he do. That brother, you want to get him to come preach for you, he says, well, just give me some, some, some playing fuel, and I'll fly myself there. And he has a ministry to teach young black people how to be pilots. But he is given his community every year anywhere between 4 and $5 million. So nobody around Upper Marlboro complains about an inability to park, get to their house, get out of their house, because if they go and happen to, to complain to HOA, HOA goes, so excuse me? Do we need to call you a moving truck? Because we are sure from whence our blessings flow. Not only that, but they take up space in the neighborhoods. Members commute in for worship and leave, do not pay taxes, and is a net drain on the neighborhood. Do you realize what it's costing this community for this 501c3 to be here? This space could be used for a revenue-generating, tax-paying organization, but you are getting a tax break to be here and pour nothing back into this community. So, church in the community is a fortress. Church to the community is a savior. Now, what do you mean by that, preacher? It desires to bless, contribute to the community on its. So this is when people say, no, no, we do want to influence the community. That's why we have a soup kitchen. When did this community tell you they wanted soup? <laughs> we're, we're, collecting, we're collecting boots for the winter. When did somebody from this community come and ask you for boots? You are, you are kind and considerate. Right? No, when, 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 do we, when, when, when did that happen? Not only that, but it spends some generally small resources in the community so that we can pat ourselves on the back. See, the fortress lowers its drawbridge on Sunday, Saturday, then raises it up, and then nobody sees anybody until the rest of the week. And this church, this is what this church does. The church to the community convenes a meeting on Mount Olympus of the gods. And we decide that the mortals need coats. We descend from our churches giving coats to people with coats. <laughs> and then we return to our churches and give a mission report. We passed out 1,000 coats, Pastor. There are 1,000 people warmer for our efforts and sacrifices. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I'm silly. I'm putting my Limited access involvement of community stakeholders and plans, right? Takes up space in the community, performs services, does not pay taxes, and generally speaking is a neutral influence, right? Let's go to, I'm gonna go, cause I'm gonna get y'all to the, to, the, to the practicals of what we can do. Church with the community is what we should be striving to be. A church with the community spends significant resources in and on the community. I see five T's here. Five T's, talent, treasure, temple, testimony, And temple, temple, talent, treasure, testimony, and talent, something. Treasure, is that what it is? Thank you. Don't get old. See, y'all young folk over there, don't get old like me. Don't get Spending time, talent, treasure, temple, and testimony in the community. Not only that, but uses a participatory community and church planning process combining desires and outcomes of both. What can we partner with to achieve here that would benefit us and the community? 
Not only that, unleashes gifts, skills, and resources already present in the community. I caught the last part of the young man's um, presentation on using social media and unlocking, unleashing the gifts, the skill sets, the talents of the young people who we forced to be in church and fall asleep on me. <laughs> That's all right, I do it too. I t look, I told the preacher, this is my friend. I said, it's a good possibility because I'm on the road a lot. If he wasn't preaching, I might have slept in a day. I got a three-year-old. <laughs> Y'all know what it's like to have a three-year-old? She don't care about my sleep. She don't care nothing about me sleeping. My sleeping is an impediment to her achieving some goal that she concocted in her room while I was trying to sleep. And she comes and reminds me and she tells me of that. Daddy, 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 daddy. Right? So, so I understand. I would have been sleeping. Not only that, but here's the last thing. It's a convener, a partner, a responder to the community. Although it does not pay taxes, it is a net plus to the community. You're wondering, how can it be a net plus without paying taxes? Because it allows convening, it rents out and or gives this space to community groups. Like, I don't know, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, allowing the Tacoma people of the civic leaders to come and have their meetings here. Right, raising the awareness of this organization. So now, let's talk about how to have constant contact. Now here's where it gets practical. And this is gonna be very easy, because y'all all know this part. Christ's method alone brings what? Y'all know this, don't y'all? Right? He mingled with men as one who desired their good. Right, y'all know that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now watch this. Let's make it work for us. Let's get practical. Now this is what I do. This is what I, I do for a living, this part. The first part is me having fun. This is, the, this is the fun part for me. So we want to talk about Seattle. Seattle, Tacoma, Bellevue, Washington. Metropolitan area. Some quick facts about this place. 64% of the population of this area is Caucasian. 16% is Asian alone, 8% two or more races, 7% Hispanic, and I want us to focus on, I'm sorry, I came to the Washington Ministerium, it's called Regional, which is dog whistle for black. I say true things. <laughs> you mean the African American? <laughs> too much through tr too much true things. It's all good. I would have turned it off too. I ain't black. I'm an African. Ain't that what you just told us? <laughs> now watch this. This is good. So what that means is what that means is. Of the 4,018,762 people who live in Seattle metro area, 246,767 are black or African American. Now that should excite you. In the Washington Ministerium, you have 1,650 Seventh-day Adventists on the books. I pull, I do data, so I like an analytic. I don't like to just talk out of, you know, that place. <laughs> don't. Don't, don't, let it go. I'm silly, right? So this should be exciting. That, that should represent like, woo, 246,000, but let's drill down on this. Now, religion in Seattle, 52% of people in Seattle are Christian. 10% are non-Christian. 37% are unaffiliated. Now, to a Seventh-day Adventist back in the day, in like the 60s, all of this was free reign. Christian? Oh, no, no, no. You haven't heard the three angels' message. <laughs> Let me call you up a little higher. <laughs> right? <laughs> Unaffiliated? <laughs> well, let me tell you about my Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and affiliate you. Right? This, this right here would make the E.E. E. Cleveland's, the Walter R. Teases, the, 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 it would make them salivate. Right? But here's what we're facing nowadays. The racial ethnic composition among Christians who are in the Seattle metro area, percentage of Christians who are in the, in the Seattle metro area who identify as white, black, Asian, Hispanic. So the majority of the people identifying as Christian are actually white. 
only 7% is black. Right? So 7% of that 267,000, which is 17,400 and something, are black folk. 2% of the unaffiliated are black folk. That's another 4,900 people. So even with the 1650, if each one of us in the ministerium did what I'm going to show you, we could double our numbers in less than a year. That's if you stop waiting on the preachers to do it. Stop waiting on a hired Bible worker to do it. Stop waiting on the conference to give you money to do it. Right? Watch this. This is the other thing. This is the race gap. You know where this is the race gap at? This is King County. Across the lifespan, black residents in King County face systemic racism and disadvantages and disproportionately impact physical, mental, and social health as well as the educational, economic, and opportunities of black communities. This right here, this, yo, this, this is gold. This is gold to a denomination, watch this, look at those things, infant mortality, food insecurity, education, health care, income, housing, employment, environment, like this is gold to a denomination that has a health message. This is gold to a denomination that has hospitals and colleges all around the world. This should be gold to a denomination that anchors itself in a thing called stewardship. Right, if anybody should be able to leverage this for ministry opportunities, it is a black Seventh-day Adventist. If anybody, it, and again, remember, black, that means this is representative of 267,000 people. 7% of which are Christian, 2% are unaffiliated. No, that, that, nobody else is <laughs> right, and, and and so 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 here's the thing. So so these and I could I could give you statistics on these that I just I just downloaded this this race gap report that was produced in October of 2020, and I just ate it alive. The percentages of black people who you know I think it's. Uh, only three out of five children of black families will make it to their first year in school in King County. Yeah, okay, let me, let me, look, I gotta say true things. And make sure I say true things, Doc. Where are my notes at? somewhere. I can't find my notes. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> mm. Infants born to black mothers are more than two times likely to die before reaching their first birthday than infants born to white mothers, right? Black adults are more than four times as likely to run out of food without money to purchase more than white adults. This is, just, this is, this is in your area. Black adults are more than 1.5 times as likely not to have a bachelor's degree compared to white adults. Black adults are more than two times less likely to have insurance compared to white adults. Income, the median income, the median income for black households is $48,075, which is about half the median income of white households at 94,533. Black adults are evicted 5.5 times more often than white adults. Black adults represent 28% of homeless households receiving services in the homeless response system more than quadruple their percentage of the King County population. 
The economic impact of COVID-19 has exasperated many existing inequities, including unemployment. In King County, black residents have filed more than 1.2 times unemployment claims compared to white residents. Right? But we in here arguing over Black adults are more than 2.9 times likely to be living in poverty or near poverty compared to white adults. Black adult life expectancy is four years shorter than the life expectancy of white adults. So we could, we could try to tackle this alone or, or, or we could mingle with men as people who desire their good when they're confident. How could we do that, preacher? Well, we could partner with nonprofits as hands and feet, not head and heart. Preacher, break that down. See, Seventh-day Adventists, oftentimes, we can't show up and help anybody else unless we're in charge. We have to be the head and the heart of the outreach if we're going to participate. We can't show up and say, hey, Doc, where you need me at? Over there? Hey, y'all, y'all go over there. So imagine if y'all showed up in y'all t-shirts from y'all ministerium, from y'all local churches to the United Way and said, what can we do? What if y'all showed up at the Salvation Army house, because I'm going to show y'all something in the next slide, and just offered to clean up the place in y'all t-shirts? Woo! You better, you better cut it out, right? Mingle with other nonprofits as hands and feet, not head and heart. Support and help them with their cause. Don't just partner with nonprofits and organizations who share your cause. Win their confidence, and then you leverage the relationship to brand each other's PR material. So watch this. I pulled data. These are the local nonprofits within 10 miles of this church. These are just a few of them. Let me show you what you're looking at. You're looking at the Pierce County AIDS Foundation. Street Psalms that trains leaders to transform vulnerable urban communities into cities of peace for everybody. New Phoebe House provides housing services, treatment, and support to Pierce County mothers and their children impacted by chemical dependency. The Borgen Project is addressing poverty and hunger and working towards ending them both. Or what about the formerly incarcerated college graduates network? Or, or what about the College Success Foundation? Or, or, or what about AHAT, a, a, a affordable housing and treatment, which offers affordable housing and access to health care for residents uh, living with HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C in Washington State? Or what about Orphans in Africa, which is literally less than three minutes from here? Dedicated to the education of orphans, or, or, or the MDC, the Metropolitan Development Council of Tacoma, which provides services focused on improving the health and well-being of very low-income individuals. What, what if we were partnered with them as hands and feet instead of head and heart? Showed up in our church and said, how can we help you? And then invited them here as valued guests. What if, what if we brought the, 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 the CEO of College Success Foundation right here and honored them for their outreach work? What if we set aside some funds to help out the, 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 the Borgen Project? Because then what could happen is we could then say something like this. Watch this. Mount Tahoma Seventh-day Adventist Church proud partner of pick one which would make them want to say MDC proud partner of the Mount Tahoma Seventh-day Adventist Church right this is get practical right so 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 we could we could we could we could work with the nonprofits but we could also partner with local businesses uh, my lady in the white shirt on what day Sabbath. on the Sabbath Right? We could lo partner with local businesses. We could mingle with them as people who desire what? Their good, win their confidence, and then be no, we could patronize as a church body their businesses. What do you think would happen if we got all together and went down to, okay, let me, let's just, 
Uh, invite them to cater and or attend community focus events as partner and or honored guests. Or what if we then leverage that relationship to brand each other's PR materials? Where we are a proud sponsor or partner of, I don't know, what about Walgreens? When we were doing vaccine testing and vaccine awareness. What about memos? What about the MSM Deli? What about the Red Hot? What about Dirty Oscars? What about the original, all of the Frisco Freeze? These are all within five to 10 miles of this church. That what if we collected ourselves together, put on our T-shirts, and went over and just bought out the restaurant that day? Right? Let me tell you what I did. I was pastoring this church, and I believe that the Adventist church has a marketing problem, not a message problem. <laughs> right? So let me tell you what I did. I said, youth ministries, we're no longer having children's Sabbath school. Oh, the outrage. Oh, the outrage. I said, no, 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 you misunderstand. We're no longer going to call it that. We're now going to call it free babysitting. No, 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 no. But wait, there's more. Because what I did is I then contacted the Red Cross. And I told the Red Cross, I'm sorry. Now I'm going to be here till 6. Because this is what y'all need. Y'all did all that singing, dancing, announcements. But this is what y'all need. I'll be done in about 10 minutes. Right? So I invited the Red Cross, and I had them come in and train my entire youth department. Right? They came for a weekend. I paid a certain amount of dollar per head. Now, all of my youth people, my adventurer leaders, my pathfinder leaders, my children's ministry leader, they were all, now watch this, Red Cross certified babysitters. So then I put out a flyer to the community saying, we offer on Saturdays from 9 in the morning until 1 p.m. free babysitting with Red Cross certified babysitters. Put my church's logo right next to the Red Cross logo. It did. People couldn't handle that they was coming in, you know, yeah. But, they, but then we got to reorient ourselves. So we could partner with local businesses. And then the young man, I don't, I don't want to steal none of his thunder, because so I'm glad he went first. Then what we do is we follow our followers on their social media platforms. So I heard some of y'all asking, what do we do? So let, we, we've now partnered with some of those nonprofits. We've partnered with some of these businesses. And so then what we do is we, we, we follow them on our social media platforms. And we like their stuff because here's what we do. We like their posts more often than we make posts and ads for likes. Imagine, Mount Tahoma, Emerald City, y'all been posting stuff on Facebook and Instagram. I get like 10 likes. Right? 12. Right, but, but, but what, what do you think would happen if you started following those nonprofits and those businesses, liking their stuff and saying, oh, we went as Mount Tahoma to the International Hot Pancake House last week and the food was amazing. And then everybody in here started liking their stuff and talking about how amazing the service was and how great it was to partner with them. Guess what they might do? Be your 13th like. <laughs> right? More about them and less about you is how they become you. All right, the pastor looking at me. He's my friend, so. So that's how you leverage your social media. Right? These are practical things that we have to get. We have to, again, demography and psychography. What do they like? What do these businesses around here need? They have same, the same financial problems that we have after COVID-19. Some of them have to close their doors. You could be keeping, helping them keep those doors open. You could be liking them, patronizing them, right? So then, none of this works without prayer. None of it works without prayer. So one of the things I like to do when I do an evangelistic series is give out prayer cards. Now the prayer cards create prayer cells and we're able to track the people that we've prayed for from the time we started praying for them to the time we're done. Another thing is, there was this movie that came out called Fight Club. Now, Fight Club had eight rules. First rule was, you don't talk about Fight Club. The 
The second rule was you don't talk about Fight Club. The third rule was someone yells, stop, goes, limp, taps out, the fight is over. Fourth, only two guys to fight, one fight at a time. No shirts, no shoes, fights will go on as long as they have to. If this is your first time at Fight Club, you will fight. But what if we changed Fight Club and made it, I don't know, we made it prayer club. And what if we said, you will commit to praying? Because of what Jesus says in Luke 21, 36. Men ought always to pray. And remember, rule number two is, see rule number one, you will commit to praying. What if we pray whether they agree or not? Hey, can I pray with you? No, I don't want you to pray for me. Okay, that's fine. Lord, bless that lady in the purple dress. <laughs> right? Then what if you recruit prayer partners? And I'm not talking about in the church. I'm talking about your network across the country. When Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane, what he did is he said he took some people, he left them here, he put other people here, and then other people there, and they all prayed for the same thing for the same time at the same time. What if you took that neighbor and made your friends across the country pray for them at the exact same time for the exact same amount of time every day for 30 days? What if you focused on, on one person or family at a time? with no church invitations or attempt to give a Bible study. Just pray. Prayer doesn't stop once they attend or join. And if you are a Christ follower, you have to pray. See, I, I was telling a friend of mine, I said, what if you got up and you said on, on a Sabbath, you said, today I want you to go out and pray with somebody. Like in Fight Club, they started fights. Today I want you to go out and pray with somebody. Next week, I want you to go pray with that same person. Third week, I want you to pray with that same person. Now I want you to ask that person their name. Right, what if we did that in this community? I believe that if we partnered with the community and were churches with, not in, or to, we would see those 270,000 people at least impact that 7 to 2% where the 1650 on the books could easily become 3,000 in less than nine months. We don't need no money. You don't need a pastor. You don't even need a building for at least the first six months until we have something to invite them to. All right. I was supposed to be back here in, in February for Black History Month. Preacher just told me I used all my time today. <laughs> so y'all won't see me at the end of the month in February. Uh, I just want to say I took time from the person who's going to close with a sermon. Because you know there's a guy who's supposed to close with a sermon, right? I took some of his time. We happen to be the same person. The preacher just wears glasses. Y'all can't tell us apart, can you? Right, I know. Now watch this. I'm different. I'm a different person. Hey, look, I love you guys. I pray that, you know, um, some of what I shared here today, you will put into practice. And we would be intentional about trying to have koinonia and potentially jettison this idea of what today we call church. Because the pandemic has given us an opportunity to do something that you know very well. I'm closing now. This is what you can do when you can message your friends. Now, so y'all so know this group, this company called Starbucks. And this company called Starbucks, they have been trying to keep up with some of their competition, Burger King and McDonald's, right? And in doing that, they started selling breakfast sandwiches. When they started selling breakfast sandwiches, all of a sudden, the smell of coffee was compromised by the, set, by the smell of cheese and burnt egg, right? And so while they were trying to hustle to make more sandwiches, they were hiring people who didn't know how to pour a latte. So one day, Howard Schultz, much to the chagrin of his entire board, filled with brilliant people like Steve Jobs and other individuals, decided he was going to shut down every Starbucks across the country and have everyone go in the back and learn how to pour a latte. His board went crazy lost their minds, told him he was going to ruin the company. He didn't listen. 
He shut it down. One day, everybody went in the back and learned how to pour a latte all over. After they learned how to pour a latte again, the reason why is because he started, he went and bought Starbucks because he was in Italy and walked down the back street and saw somebody pouring a, 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 a latte. And he said that there was a dance happening between the barista and the coffee. And he wanted to recreate that experience, which is why all of the fast food industries now offer free Wi-Fi and cafe style dining. They're following Starbucks. What Starbucks did that day caused his revenue share the next quarter to more than triple. Because he shut them down and got them back to the essence of what they were supposed to be doing and who they were supposed to be. We had two years of shutdown to learn how to koinonia. I'm done. All right, I'm going to give you about 60 seconds. Catch your breath. Praise team, get ready. Do your thing. Get the preacher. About two minutes, catch your breath. Go ahead and sing. Well, that means it's over. <laughs> Come on, praise team. Um, let's water the, the preacher's beak. You, you saw that in Godfather, right? <laughs>